All right, the final uh, lecture that we're going to do today is on chapter seven, work and kinetic energy. Um, so for work, we're going to we're going to define what work is. Um, and what we mean here is a mathematical, physical definition of work, um, which is different from the colloquial definition of work. Um, so work is going to be the, for the dot product of the force with the displacement. And when we're talking about a force uh, work that is entirely done in one direction, then um, we can use this form here. We do not need to do an integral. When we're talking about work where the direction, um, where the direction, the relative direction of the force and the displacement change along the path of motion, then we have to consider the integral form. Um, so I'm putting this up here. If you're in my class, you are concurrently taking calculus. So the integral will not necessarily make sense yet. The integral is the opposite of a derivative. Um, and there will be a few problems that we do in class where I'm counting on someone having done integrals before. Um, so I'm counting on you guys helping each other out so that you can see what it is conceptually. Um, but the basic idea is that if you apply a force over a longer distance, you get a large, a, it takes a larger amount of work to do that. Um, we use these vectors to define work. Um, so uh, you are looking at, so in this case, the force is actually not acting perpendicular to the displacement. So when you do this, so this is using delta, using dr for the displacement. So when you do f dot dr, it is not, uh, you have to consider the angle between them. So that magnitude is f and then cosine theta for a dot product dr. So um, the smaller the angle between the, between the two, uh, between the force and the displacement, the greater the, the work done. Um, so if you're doing work and it's perpendicular to the displacement, it's not doing, if you're applying a force and it's perpendicular to the displacement, it's not actually doing any work in the physics definition. Now, obviously there are cases like if you carry a bag of groceries, um, a lot walking down the street, it takes a lot of energy to exert that force on, but it is not doing work in that you are not getting useful, you're not getting um, any type of increase in potential energy or anything like that out of um, carrying the bag of groceries. Um, so there are a lot of cases where we will consider constant forces. So here you're pushing the lawnmower, now you actually we have to push down. What that means is that the normal force is somewhat larger because you're pushing down on the lawnmower. Um, and that's not doing any useful work. Um, but the net work is then the force times the distance that you that you travel, um, that you push the lawnmower times cosine theta. Um, now a person holding a briefcase is not doing work because the net displacement is zero. Even though it takes your muscles, your muscles are expending energy to keep that briefcase there um, because you, you have to apply the force, but that is not doing work. Likewise, you walk with a briefcase, you are walking, uh, you're, the force expended is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Okay, so if you move a couch, this way and then that way. And then there's, there's different ways that you can push a couch. If you push it the shortest distance, if the force is the same, you're probably creating less work. But let's say that this is over a carpet and here it's over a smooth floor that you can just slide it on. Then the force is less in the blue route than route A. And you kind of know this intuitively, right? You push a couch, it might be easier. It's not, the straightest path is not always less work. Um, so the path matters. Um, you can take a book from the shelf 
bring it down to some height of the table and then put it on the table. Um, you could instead take it straight from the shelf and get it all the way there. The work is going to be different in each of these cases. Springs, my favorite. Um, so there's no force at equilibrium position. Um, when you apply the, the force, so displace when you are displacing um, the, the, when you're stretching the spring, F dot DX is negative. When you're compressing the spring, F dot DX is negative. So you consider what, um, oh, and I sh so you, if you're looking at the magnitude of that force expended, um, if some force expended, you can do this. So integrals are the area under a curve. So you can actually look at the, if you have some force as a function of position, if you want to add it up, you can do uh, basically a numerical integration. You can add it up in little chunks. Um, and that is easier and harder depending on the force. There may be some problems where you're having to approximate the, the work done using a force versus distance traveled. In the case of a spring, the force is um, <clears throat> the force is negative um, for negative displacements and sorry is negative for positive displacements and positive for negative displacements. Um, it's a straight line, and you would actually take the look at the area under this curve. Um, And that turns out to be a parabola, but so, um, so actually I can write that one up there. So in that case, F of spring dot dx, and then you're integrating over that path, it's going to be negative one half k x squared. And then you have to think about the sign, whether you are adding energy to the system or decreasing energy or decreasing the energy of the system. Okay. Conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is your friend. So far we've done problems that entirely involve solving kinematic equations. Now we're going to um, we're going to teach you a way that's often easier, which is conservation of energy. Um, so you can write the potential energy for some system. If you, the potential energy due to gravity is mgy. Um, and then we have the kinetic energy of something moving is one half mv squared. So if we want to calculate how um, how high the, um, the, in the let's do this problem. You have to calculate how high the loop has to be for the so the car can go uh, around the loop without falling. Well, um, at the if we want to minimize the normal force, if the, if the car is going too fast, it's going fast, it's faster, it's going to get a little bit more of a kick from the normal force. So if, if we write, we can actually draw our force diagram and we've got the normal force and at the top of the loop and we've got, um, got weight. Um, so MA equals weight plus normal force. Now we only, and then we know this is circular motion. We need it to move in a circle. So the um, smallest acceleration it can have to move in a circle is going to have no normal force. And the acceleration has to be equal to V squared over R. So how fast is it moving? We can say, M 
v squared over r equals m g. So the slowest it can go has v squared equals r g. Therefore, it needs to have a kinetic energy at the top. Let's say, so the way that we do an energy conservation problem, this is maybe not the easiest to start with. The way we do an energy conservation problem is to say the energy at the beginning equals the energy at the end. So now we can say MGY1, and it starts at, it's implicit in the problem that it starts at rest, so there's no kinetic energy, equals M g y 2 plus the kinetic energy at the top of the loop. So 1 half m and then v squared, which we just said was r g. Um, so now I can use energy conservation. I have masses everywhere. I have a g everywhere. And the difference in the heights, and I can simplify this a little bit, y1 minus y2, that's how much higher we start, has to be equal to r over 2. And actually, the rest of the problem used capital R, so I'm going to go back here and change my little r's to capital R's. Okay, so I have to be at least r over 2 above where uh, I end up. And then here, I'm told that y2 is 2r, so y1 is 2.5r. So I solved that problem without having done any kinematic equations just by energy conservation. Now, if I had to worry about friction, I'm going to lose energy from the top of the, um, of the ramp. So I probably would have to have a little bit more height just to get it to go. Um, here's another problem where you can use energy conservation. Um, so a bullet strikes the board. Now, before the bullet, the initial, the initial energy is going to be um, one half m v squared of the bullet because it hasn't hit anything. Now um, we have the board stops the bullet, um, and usually what you so you would have the board getting pushed some by the bullet. Um, this one's a little more complicated to solve exactly. Um, so then you, you have the board doing work to, to get the bullet to lose energy. Um, and you can figure out, so if you only, if you, the board is fixed, then um, you would have the force of the board on, dotted with the distance is equal to the amount of work done. Um, if you, um, you can calculate, assuming that it is constant, um, a constant force, you can calculate how long it takes for the bullet to stop in the board, for instance, and you can use that to calculate the acceleration. And then you could calculate how uh, you could calculate how um, what the force if you knew how long it traveled you could calculate the force required to get the bullet to stop or you could calculate the acceleration if you knew how long it took to stop um, and use that to calculate the velocity. A few different problems you could do from this. All right, power. Power is the amount of energy per unit time 
Strictly speaking, this is the derivative of energy with respect to time. We often approximate it as the change in energy as a function of time. This assumes that you have constant, um, that you have a constant change in energy as a function of time, um, which is usually a pretty good approximation for many different solutions, situations. We are going to use the, um, we will sometimes use delta E over delta T. All right, so what is the power expended in doing 10 pull-ups in 10 seconds? Now, the net, if he really does end up, you're talking about the work on the system, the person doing pull-ups does, uh, ends up at the same place they started, so they don't do any work. Um, if you um, look at the amount of power expended by um, the the man's arms, then you have, and assume that there is no power on the way down, then you can calculate the amount of um, work done on the way up as 10 times m uh, delta mg delta y. So 10 cycles going up, neglect going down because the arm muscles are not doing anything. And then you would do, the power would be the work divided by 10 seconds. But that's only how much he expends in his arms. And that is still the net work done on the system is zero because he ends up in the same place he started. OK, how much power is needed to move a car up a hill at constant speed? Um, so there you can calculate how high, so here you would have to figure out what the change in height is um, per unit time. So if the velocity, we're going to use, it's an inclined plane, but we're actually going to use this coordinate system, x, y, and then the velocity, the y component of the velocity is going to be um, vy equals the magnitude of v sine theta, where that's that 15% grade. Um, so your um, change in height, the change in y per unit time is simply going to be the, that's the y derivative, that's v sine theta. Now, your ener potential energy is m, ah, Ooh, I've used a bad, um, I don't want to use P for potential energy here. I want to use U for potential energy because M G Y gives your, is your potential energy from gravity and the change in the potential energy per unit time is going to be M G D Y D T. So m g v sine theta. Now that's a minimum because that's assuming you have no friction. But the bare minimum that you have to expend to get the car up the hill is going to be m g sine theta, m g v sine theta. All right, a few examples. You have your lawnmower. Um, you're pushing it forward. The change in uh, the, the displacement is entirely along the x-axis. So f dot d is going to give you f sine uh, f cosine theta um, times d. So your work is f d cosine theta. A box. Um, if you are pushing up the hill. Then, um, and if you're pushing this up the ramp, then your displacement is up the ramp as well. So 
your the amount of work done is simply going to be the force times the displacement because you're pushing in the direction of motion. Now then you're going to have some friction that you have to worry about if you're actually if you have to actually apply that force. So it's harder to do with more friction. Pulling a wagon. Um, if you do not pull exactly straight, and most of us don't, um, then you're going to be expending a force at an angle. But the only force that does any work is the one that is parallel to the direction of the, is the part that's parallel to the direction of motion. So in this case, the component of the force that is, so F dot B is going to be F cosine theta times D. So you're going to have 50 times 30 cosine 30 degrees. And that's the amount of work done. Now what's really going on if you, so when you are pulling somewhat upward on the wagon, you're actually, you're somewhat reducing the normal force, but that wagon's still not gonna go up in the air. Okay, here you would analyze the forces. Um, so here the, um, your normal force, so your weight is going to be mg, and then here I have to watch my angles because this is 60 degrees. So uh, in, and I'm gonna draw x positive this way, y positive that way. Um, so, my force in the x direction is negative m g sine theta. I'm going to leave it as a theta to the very end. Um, x hat and then minus m g cosine theta y hat. So my normal force has to exactly counteract the y component of the weight because we hope that this person on a stretcher does not bounce up and down. Um, but the normal force couldn't do it anyway. So this has to equal mg cosine theta y hat, and it's positive. Um, and that tells me that the friction um, is so here, actually, the friction is going to be in the opposite direction from what's shown um, if we're pulling the man up. Well, is he going down? If he's going down, then his net motion is, if it, his net motion really is down, and it kind of looks like it is, friction is going to be negative. Mu K, because he's moving, Mg cosine theta x hat. And then your net force in is all going to be in the x, x direction. And you have negative m g sine theta uh, and I'm going to just keep the x hats so that it makes sense as I wrap up around you as I have to go over several different lines m u k m g cosine theta x hat plus tension so if you're trying to get him down slowly, um, that's going to tell you what the tension should be. If you want him to say, oh, an X hat.
So if you are moving them down at constant velocity, you could use this to calculate that the tension has to, has to be, if you're trying to get the acceleration to be zero and you're easing them down the mountain, tension has to be mg sine theta plus mu k mg cosine theta. So a complicated one, you can get increasingly complicated. And this is how you'd solve this with, uh, with, uh, and then this is how you'd solve this with kinematic equations and force diagrams. Now, if you wanna know how much work did you do, how much work did the um, tension do, you can take this tension that you get from this analysis and multiply it by the distance traveled. Alternately, you could um, look at the difference in the change in potential energy, and that's going to tell you how much, um, that's going to also be a way to measure how much work was done. OK, when you use this conservation of energy, so it's easier than kinematics. So we're going to set our coordinate system here, and you start at a height of two meters with zero velocity. So initially, you have a potential energy of y of mg y initial, but you have zero kinetic energy. At the end, you have zero. Um, you have zero potential energy and you have one half m um, v squared. Um, so I think this problem might be over constrained. Yeah, this one might be a, this you if you were told, if you, let's say you don't know how much, um, let's say you don't know how fast it's going, um, and you want to figure out how fast it's going at the top, and you know how fast it's going at the bottom, m g y initial plus one half m v initial squared equals m g it's a blah 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 equals one half m v final squared. So I'm saying there's no potential energy at the bottom. I have set my zero at the bottom of the ramp for the for y positions. And I can solve here and I can figure out what the initial velocity um, that's going to equal the the initial velocity squared equals the final velocity squared um, plus two g y initial. So kinetic, so energy conservation when you can use it is beautiful. Here's an example you could do where you're given the force as a position of x, and to calculate the um, the work done, you could calculate. You can calculate the area underneath the curve, um, which is actually easier to do geometrically than than thinking about it necessarily by forces. All right, and with that, we're going to stop chapter seven, and I'll see you for chapter eight.